All right, day three. We came to Cheetah's Rock. Okay, so we came here to Cheetah's Rock. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what that is, you will find out sooner than Lots of animals, lots of playing with them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, stay tuned. Put them together. Okay. Here we go. There we go. It says six and eight weeks. Yeah, six and eight weeks. Here we go, girls. Look. Yeah, they're, they're, they're still not used to people. It's not a difficult hike. It's not stressful. Not exercise. But we do ask that you leave all of your bags in the office. And that is because the animals want to take your bags. The animals will fight you today. If you have bags that want to take them from you, it's easier for you and for the animals if you are able to leave the bags in the office. On the tour, we actually don't need a lot. We really don't need to have much with us. And you will be having very close interactions with them. And there will be no safety barriers between you and the animals. And there will be, be big and small animals waiting to say hello to you. However, the biggest difference between us and other places is that we do not prepare our animals for you. Now what that means is that our animals are completely natural, so we have not declawed them or defanged them. They still have all of their teeth and their claws, their natural weapons, as nature's intended. We've not pulled anything out to make it more safe for you. And also, we do not give, not our guests or the animals, any drugs. We don't use any drugs here, so everyone today is sober. I hope. <laughs> Following Mr. Harry. I see lots of animals today. Oh, lion in there. That's a white one. I think that could be Aslan. They spend their days sharing grasses and playing together in peace and harmony. Even if they're different species, but they live in peace and Chaka is the boss of all horses in that area. Chaka is a clever boy. And you'll see on your own today if he's the clever or not. So very important thing to know while he's in this arena. We have to sit here in silence. And if there's anything interesting, you are free to flap your hand. But not loud, just a little to show your appreciation. After everything, we have a chance to interact with him. You will come in here, feeding him with your hands, taking pictures from very close and playing with him as well. As I told you before that he's a clever boy, I hope you will also like to learn from you. So I hope everyone today learns something new to train him. This is Chaka and he is our 11 year old Grant Zebra Stallion. Chaka was born in a zoo in Germany, but when he was only one year old, this zoo wanted to kill and slaughter him. This is unfortunately the sad truth behind many zoos around the world that they are producing a lot of animals just for the cute little baby because it attracts us. But babies, they do grow bigger. Some of these animals uh, become more dangerous or simply there is no more space left for them. And so these zoos, and it's still completely legal, will have these extra animals be killed. We got a call and we were asked if we wanted to save Chaka's life. And of course we did. It looks as similar to horses are in their characters, nothing like horses at all. Well, this is because horses were bred for thousands and thousands of years for the human purpose. The nicest were always crossed with the nicest to have animals that were uh, useful for riding, willing to do farm work, even stupid enough, as they say, to go into wars for a different species, go into our wars. Yet, the complete opposite is true for the zebras. In the wild, with the tall grass and the many predators, those zebras that did not kick the hardest or run the fastest simply did not survive. And so they did not pass on their genetics. The remaining zebras became wilder and wilder. So, with Chaka Rod, we need to learn to trust one another. But also we need to learn to communicate with one another. Because without communication between us, there is no relationship possible. So how did we learn to communicate with Chaka? Well, we humans are not smart enough to learn the language of zebras, but zebras are very clever and they can understand our words. And with a lot of patience, positive reinforcement, animal handling and training, we achieve this. We're able to communicate with Chaka and form trust with him. 
So as you can see, Chaka really enjoys his cuddles and scratches from Enya. I mean, he knows that you love him very dearly and you should allow Enya to touch him all over his very sensitive body. In fact, Chaka should never worry or be afraid that Enya is grooming him, that Enya is touching him. Uh, grooming and touching is a natural part of social contact and interaction. And he learned that he was using natural. <laughs> yeah. It's in his blood, he knows. <laughs> and you might know from your dogs at home that dogs are also, uh, well, they're predators, and predators are intelligent and able to bring things to you. And, uh, <laughs> Chaka is not a predator, and so he shouldn't actually have this instinct. Like, for instance, predators would bring things to their babies naturally, because, like food. But a grass eater would never do this. Well, as I've said earlier, zebras are very intelligent, more than domestic horses, more than you, news or wildebeest. And so Chaka also quickly learned that you can bring things. And in fact, we were able to switch the words, uh, not the words, switch the items and use the same word. And he's clever enough to know that the command means bring something, so when we use a dragon, it did not confuse him, and he was able to bring the dragon as well. But how would we know, I mean, after everything we've shown you and told you now, how would we know if this positive training, this trust training is truly happening and working? There's only one way to find out, and that is to ask him to lie down nicely beside us. And of course, if we have a nice picnic, we have to have lots of nice treats, and he knows that. And this is a very, very trusting position for Chaka to be in. But what is the benefit of this kind of training that we're doing with our animals? Why does it benefit us? Why does it benefit them? It's a lot more effort, but there is a positive reason. If we ever have to do any kind of treatment on them, let's say like a medical treatment, something small like on the hooves, clean a hook, uh, give a small injection, or you know some ointment on the skin, that we would never ever have to use. We would never have to use any dangerous tranquilizers, drugs, or sedatives. Because here at Cheers Rock, as you can see, we believe in hugs and not drugs. And this is a big benefit to the animal because sedatives, drugs, and anesthetics are very dangerous for that animal. They can have bad reactions, they can die from it, and it's a lot of stress. So we try to have a stress-free environment. And Chaka is in fact the boss of the family group. And he is the boss of a bachelor group. What is a bachelor group? All male, yes, very common. I'm sure some of the guys here have been part of a bachelor group before in younger days. You want to see oh. some bush babies? Yeah. on your left hand and keep him close to your chest like a baby hold the bottle up mm -hmm. Look over here. 
And the reason why we have dip dip is also they are rescues. We got them from a hotel. What happened was this hotel um, had staff members that went inside of the forest and put out traps. And it was at these, it was, uh, they put the trap, they caught two dip dip. And luckily for us, the hotel manager was a nice man. These staff members were on the deck. And luckily for us, the staff uh, uh, manager of the staff, we saw it happening. He stopped them and he took them away and brought them to us. And we haven't taken care of them since. The male is seeing this and enjoying it and deciding that he will say, I do. He will then go and poop on top of that. And once they've made a little ball of shit together, they are now married. And they will <coughs> stay together for the remainder of their lives. However, it's quite sad, but sometimes a bit beautiful. It doesn't always happen, but from time to time, the older dipdicks, if the partner dies, then the other one tends to pass away as well. Uh, you do this, get, you do get this in seabirds as well, like across the Atlantic, um, across oceans, that migrate together, partners for life. Uh, it's, it's just, just the trauma of losing your lifelong partner. At the, they just don't, they give up. They usually stop eating, stop moving, and they'll die from things like exposure, malnutrition, and it's quite sad, but a bit beautiful at the same time. That they do care so much for one another. We can count, there's only 76 of them left. Wow. Very, very How little. many? Yeah, 20. So we have 20 out of 76. Just <laughs> user. So I'm flying in. Come to number 10. Yeah, number 10. And these tortoises are originally come from Madagascar, but they were actually stolen in 1996. They were stolen from Madagascar and shipped around the world. For 21 years, they were missing. And how they ended up here was that Mr. Zero, uh, is this one? He came here first. Yeah, I would watch your fingers. No, he, no, he won't. Um, so they were stuck by Gascon and they were shipped around for 21 years. Uh, Mrs. Zero showed up first. He was uh, brought to us by one of the local vets. The vet uh, had no idea it was a plowshare, so I thought it was just a normal tortoise. It was after some research that we found out that, in fact, it was a plowshare and it was extremely rare. We then had to contact CITES and told CITES that we have a plowshare. They went ahead and contacted Interpol because they knew that this must have been one of the 20 missing or stone tortoises. Eventually, uh, yeah, CITES and Interpol came together, did a massive investigation, and they found out, they, well, they, they found the rest of the tortoises. Uh, they were moved from Madagascar to Mozambique, and then Mozambique to Tanzania, and from Tanzania eventually were being shipped to Dubai over the 21 years. That guy, um, we don't know why. We have not done anything to the animals since they've been here. They are all original as they as they've come here. Uh, so we don't know if that was an amputation or someone cut it off to try and sell it. Two of them are also missing their plowshares. We don't know why. They have these carvings in their shell that the peat tasted. They put paint on them that also came like that. We have kept them as they are. We don't want to remove any of the paint. It'll be dangerous to them to use chemicals on a brush, a steel brush. So our animals, we are just keeping them as they are. We do obviously do medical checks and make sure that they get food and they're healthy. The only danger that they have here is the other tortoises when they fight. Besides that, they're good and healthy. Straight in straight. In and wait until he takes Yeah, next one. We have found out where they are and they have killed all of them within mm. only one day. Mm. We know now because of their enormous blood market value 
of 150,000 to 200,000 US dollars for one trophy. We would produce targets for bullets instead of doing something for conservation. Hello, my boy. Hello, my boy. Yeah, thank you. So, another question about releasing animals. Do you think it is possible to release hand raised lions? Let's say tawny lions with a smaller black market value. A normal lion, can it be released when it had human contact? Well, you can see no. There was only two times the social safe successful release. The first one was Ilsa. I think everyone knows Ilsa, the story born free. It's a true story. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> Just ask to you remain patient until we are done with it. Tigers are a little bit uh, bigger. Uh, yes, uh, generally they are bigger, they are the biggest out of all the big cats, mm -hmm. uh, with the Siberian tiger okay. being the biggest. He is a Bengal okay. tiger. He's a golden tabby uh, Bengal tiger. Just like the white lion is still a lion, it's a color variant, so is the golden tabby. Oh my boy. His name is Garfield? Yes, it's Garfield. Hi hey, Garfield. You know, growing. Ligers never stop growing. <laughs> Hey, my girl. Hey, my girl. How old is she? Uh, two and three quarters. So yeah, what, two years, nine months, eight months, more or less. And she's a Siberian or no? No, she's she's a lion. She, oh. So she's a yeah, she's the same as Aslan. She's a white lion. Uh huh. Um, also from the Timbati, also from South Africa. Ten years old for a cheetah. Sorry. Yes. They do very rarely grow older than five in nature, very rarely older than eight in captivity. Tyson was with us for eight years. He was a family member. He was an old cheetah and we knew that this will happen just because of natural age. When we saw the first signs of illness, we have called Dr. Peter Caldwell to fly in from South Africa together with his veterinarian assistant to help us. We were fighting for Tyson's life for 10 days. We needed to knock him out with total anesthetic twice to give him all the liquids he needed, to give him all the antibiotics. We did force feed him because we hoped that his immune system will kick in and fight all these little demons in his body. No. His immune system gave up and Tyson passed at the 1st of May from a bacterial pneumonia. Alright, so some of you might already know that cheetahs are the fastest living animals on land. They are able to reach speeds of up to about 100 kilometers per hour. However, they can only maintain this speed for about 30 seconds or 400 meters. After this, they are overheating and then they are no longer able to hunt for the rest of the day. Now, this does not mean that they go to bed hungry. In fact, cheetahs are one of the most successful solitary hunting species that exist. They have a higher success rate than even leopards, tigers, and jaguars. So they're not going to bed hungry. Yet their numbers are still decreasing, declining. This is because they're facing several issues. The first issue being habitat <coughs> loss, which is only followed by habitat fragmentation. And thirdly, something very unique to them is that cheetahs have a very weak immune system. This is due to a genetic bottleneck. Now a genetic bottleneck basically means that some time ago, when cheetahs were nearly extinct, there was only a few left, and they inbred to stay alive in the species, and today all cheetahs are closely related. They're so closely related to the fact that veterinarians say that you're able to give a blood transfusion from one cheetah to any other cheetah with no problem. However, being closely related does compromise the immune system, and there is this very weak. There's another uh, situation, or not issue, but something that affects cheetahs and their survivability, and that is that cheetahs are a solitary species. They do not live in big groups, so they don't hunt bait as they should. 
They don't have other chairs to look out for them and to protect them. When they do meet, and those numbers are far below that of a sale population, so they're not meeting that often and as they should, they're not mating as often as they need to. But when they do mate and have babies, the mother can have anywhere between two and four cubs. These cubs, however, have an extremely high mortality rate. That means that one in 20, 5% of them survive to full adulthood. The other 95% do not make it until the age of three. And the reason of this, for this mortality is that they're dying from things like starvation, uh, diseases, they're being killed by other predators as a form of competition as well as they're being eaten by other species like that food. So the cubs are very, very vulnerable. The mother, when she goes out to hunt, she needs to make sure that she goes out, makes a successful hunt, and gets back to her babies as soon as Tiger seen in nature was 1932.